Hi there, my name is Betsy Woodruff. This is Woodruff and Strauss, our blogging heads show, and I'm really excited about the guest today, David Neer, who writes about elections for Daily Coast. I've been reading his morning elections email for a long time, and it is extremely helpful if you're super interested in whatever small new developments are happening in races you haven't been paying attention to. So I get a whole bunch of morning emails, and I think I can honestly say that David's is the one that I read the most regularly and get the most from. For what that's worth. So um, I'm very excited that he's here, dorky headset and all. Uh, hopefully we'll have some interesting things to talk about. So David, anything I should add about you? Uh, relevant action items or background? Uh, well, thank you for the very kind introduction, Betsy, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Fantastic. Uh, so the first thing is David is a bit of a polling expert. So I was hoping that you could talk for maybe 30 seconds to two minutes about how to be a responsible poll consumer for people who are not polling experts and don't really know what it means if something is a PPP poll or a Rasmussen poll or an internal poll. What is what is the user's guide to knowing what you should think about when you think about polling? That is an excellent question because there is so much polling data out there. And even for the experts, it can be hard to make sense of. What I say is this, my one single piece of advice is never rely on just a single poll to come to a conclusion about an election. And what you can do is go to any one of a number of poll aggregation sites to see what all the polls are saying. So instead of looking at just one poll, say, of the Senate race in Arkansas, you want to look at and see what every pollster is saying about that race. So one of the most user-friendly sites is Huffington Post Pollster. And they keep track of every single poll and they put together really wonderful charts that show you the average of all the polls together. Averaging polls is not a perfect science, but it is much better to look at 10 polls than it is to look at one poll. So if you hear about one poll and you're not really sure what it means, go to Huffington Post Pollster see what the average is, see if that poll looks close to the average, far from the average, and that will at least give you a sense of where things truly stand. So a news story that says breaking news, poll release, it says this thing has happened, is not necessarily as informative or helpful as a bunch of polls coming out over a period of time. That's exactly right. And that kind of story that you describe is always my least favorite story. You know, poll shows Scott Walker surging into the lead or whatever the case might be. One poll shows that. It doesn't talk about what the other polls show. And you really have to look at the entire data picture to get a true feeling. Are there are there particular mistakes you see journalists make a lot when they're covering polls? Are there like giveaways or words people use or whatever that make that indicate that maybe someone's write up on a poll wouldn't be super helpful? Sure. One phrase that you see a lot is uh, in re reporters will talk about a close poll being a statistical dead heat or a virtual tie. And the reality is that's uh, playing a little bit too fast and loose. If someone has a two point lead in a poll, uh, the odds are still that they're ahead. The chances there's a good chance that maybe they're behind, but the chances still are that they're ahead. So calling it a, a, a dead heat uh, just because it happens to be close is a little bit misleading. Uh, you, it's in the margin of error. Like if there's a four-point four margin of error, the person's up by two points. It's misleading to say that's a dead heat. I, I, I think so. It's certainly correct to call it close. Mm -hmm. And you raise another good issue, which is this famous margin of error. And I don't want to get too deep into the weeds here, but that's also something that's very poorly understood. If a poll has a four-point margin of error, it means four points plus or minus for either candidate. So if you have two candidates, one is at 44%, let's say, and one at 40%. If you have a margin of error of four points, the candidate at 44 could be anywhere from 40 to 48 in theory, and the candidate at 40 could be anywhere from 36 to 44. Margin so there's like a radius. Exactly. Okay. Uh, the, the key thing is that the margin of error is plus minus, so it's always double the reported number. Okay. That's valuable. Uh, I'm pretty sure I knew that, but it's good, it's good to hear you uh, verbalize. Do you have a favorite pollster? I 
certainly like PPP a lot, and not just because they're a Democratic pollster and not just because they've done a lot of work with Daily Coast, but because they're very transparent about releasing cross tabs. Cross tabs are the detailed information that go behind a poll. You know, a poll might say, you know, Republican X is beating Democrat Y by 3%, but the cross tabs will show you you know, is this person leading among white voters, among black voters, among men, among women? And that kind of information is absolutely invaluable to analysts for a whole set of reasons. It just gives a fuller picture of a race. And it also gives you a chance to see, does the composition of the poll make sense? Does it have too many white voters? Does it have too many older voters? Is it too female? And PPP really does a very good job of providing its cross tabs. And there are other firms that do as well. Some firms never do though. Mm -hmm. And, uh, for analysts, that, that can be frustrating. Do you have a least favorite pollster? Least favorite pollster? Me pollster? No. <laughs> uh, you know, John Lachlan uh, got absolutely great with the Coles for the poll that he did showing Eric Cantor with a 30-something point lead for. He wound up losing his infamous primary by double digits. But that wasn't Lachlan's only terrible poll. He had had a lot of other really bad misses before. So, uh, yeah, he was something to watch out for. And he hasn't really seen much polling lately. I think his reputation has taken a bit of a hit. You know, there, there are a number of pollsters who don't really have the greatest of reputations. But if you're the sort of person who does want to get more into weeds, Nate Silver, who runs the website 538, Recently, just issued a new pollster report card, where he has gone back all the way to 1998, after every public poll he could possibly find, and given pollsters grades based on how they've performed. And you can see whether a pollster misses by a little, by a lot. They tend to be biased toward Democrats, biased toward Republicans, and so that's a very helpful tool. But that's sort of getting them to moving from polling 101 to polling 201. <laughs> How did you get interested in poll watching? I started by following the 2004 presidential election, actually. I realized that after the crazy Florida 2000 epic debacle, that I had gone into that election without a really good sense of where things stood on a state-by-state -state basis, and I, I wanted to change that for myself for 2004, and so I, I started to study the polling, and uh, I was... Uh, pretty much self-taught, and I learned a couple of lessons the hard way. I was completely sure that John Kerry would win Florida and Ohio that year, and uh, that clearly didn't work out. And uh, it was very instructive, though. And so ever since then, I have really been interested in what the polls can tell us. And uh, they can't tell us everything, but they can tell us a lot. Interesting. That makes sense. Uh, well, segueing from that into a race that is all of a sudden being pulled a ton, I think, oddly enough, Kansas is maybe the most exciting state this election cycle as far as a late-breaking, very surprising situation. What, what are you thinking as far as the way the Senate race there looks? Kansas has been absolutely fascinating. This is a state that has not elected a Democrat to the Senate since 1932 at the height of the New Deal. And we're not going to elect a Democrat this year either because there's no Democrat on the ballot. But of course, Democrats are very excited about that because they have an even better chance now to defeat a Republican incumbent, longtime Senator Pat Roberts, thanks to the candidacy of wealthy independent Greg Orman. And all of the recent polling has shown Orman with lead on Roberts. And for Kansas to be the most exciting state in the nation is, is hard to believe. It's, it is such a dark red state. It is not usually home to interesting races, but Roberts has really hurt himself by going DC is, is the criticism that he really seems to be a creature of the beltway. And he has put his foot in his mouth a number of times in talking about how little he, little time he has spent in his home state of Kansas. And that, uh, that kind of knock, he's certainly not the first senator to face that sort of problem. Dick Luger in Indiana lost the primary two years ago for a very similar reason. 
how is it actually going to turn out? You know, Republicans have really been turning up the heat on, on Orman, the independent, calling him uh, an Obama lackey or a Democrat in disguise. And those kind of attacks can be very effective in a state like Kansas. The question is, do people, people's opinions of Roberts so deep set that all of the sort of standard attacks on Orman won't work? And so far, they kind of haven't. Hmm. Uh, do you think that if Orman pulls this off, we're going to see more independent candidates running in states that are sort of deep red or deep blue and trying to launch bids without maybe the baggage of a partisan brand? That is a very interesting question, and I think the answer is yes, sort of. The stars really have to align in most states for that to happen. One way it's gotten less attention, but where something almost identical happened is the Alaska governor's race where you had a three-way race with a former Republican running as an independent and the Republican incumbent, Sean Parnell, looking quite vulnerable but able to win because the sort of anti-Parnell vote was being split between the Democrat and the independent. What happened was the Democrat there dropped out and joined the ticket of the independent, uh, a guy named Walker, who and became his lieutenant governor candidate. And polls there have shown the Walker ticket beating Parnell or edging him just slightly, and it's something that wouldn't have happened with three candidates in the race. The problem is you have to make sure that there is no third party on the ballot. You have the opposite situation in South Dakota where Republican former Governor Mike Rounds is running for an open Senate seat, and he's actually not so popular for a number of reasons, but South Dakota is still a very red state. And again, you have a Democrat running and an independent running, and polls show that one or the other might be able to beat Rounds in a one-on-one -on -one race, but in a three-way race, uh, Rounds is, 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 will probably win with a plurality. So yeah, we could see more of this in the future, but you have to have a lot of cooperation. And if you want to talk about it further, the one exception to that is California, where things could get very interesting in the near future. What, is, there, what, is there a third-party candidate in California? Well, California in general, they moved to a new primary system starting in 2012 called the top two primary system, where the top, all candidates run together from all parties in a single primary, and the top two vote getters from any party go to a general election. So you're guaranteed a general election with only two candidates no matter what. You can't have a third party splitter. So you've had some situations in some blue districts or blue areas where Republicans have decided to run as independents and then you wind up with instead of a D versus R race in November, a D versus I race. And there are a lot of voters who feel more comfortable pulling a lever for an independent than they would for a Republican, making for some closer races. And I think you'll start to see a lot more of that in California in the future. So the top two primary system is a problem for Democrats running statewide in California, potentially? It could potentially be. Uh, so far, that hasn't quite happened. Uh, the other problem is that you've had a few races where you've had two Republicans wind up in the general election because you've had a whole mess of Democrats splitting the vote in the primary. Uh, that happened in one, in one House race in 2012 and another in 2014, sort of came close to happening in a statewide race for Comptroller. And uh, it's a kind of thing that no one's really going to care about until it happens in a big race. And if all of a sudden one day you wind up with a California Senate race with two Republicans facing off in November, people are gonna go crazy. Is that conceivable, like that could happen? It could. It could. If you had two sort of somewhat decent Republican candidates and then eight Democrats splitting the Democratic vote, you know, uh, you could have a Republican being one and two and then the Democrats being three through 12. That's crazy. Or whatever. Republicans being one and two if each of them got like 20 percent of the vote or something. Exactly. Wow. Is that, is that kind of what happened when Schwarzenegger became governor? just had a million Democrats running and then like obviously different primary system, but did he, was he able to capitalize on that? Schwarzenegger benefited from a, from a different system where basically where everyone ran together in just one election. Mm -hmm. And I think also times were different then. And there was so much discontent with the, with the incumbent Gray Davis at the time, but, but it's sort of a similar phenomenon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So assuming that and taking, I guess a fairly cynical view and assuming that the California election board and apparatus are, are fairly influenced by Democrat Party interests, which I don't know if that's true, but that seems to, as a general rule, be a pretty safe bet. Why would they have made this change? 
So the reason why the top two exists in California is because voters voted it in at the ballot box. And actually, some Republicans were pretty smart and they realized that this would probably benefit them. And I think partisan Democrats realize that this system is is not helpful for them. And uh, maybe one day someone will try to overturn it at the ballot box if, if, if that sort of debacle situation happens that I was talking about before. Huh, interesting. That is very interesting. That's good to know. Um, sort of circling back to Kansas a little bit. Sure. You looking at polls, data information, are you seeing different stories with the governor's race versus the Senate race? Or do you think they're both going to end up going the same way regardless of which direction? You know, I think that right now, both the governor, Sam Brownback, the Republican incumbent, and Pat Roberts, the senator, both look like they're going to lose. But I think that they're going to lose for, for very different reasons. Brownback has instituted a lot of tax cuts, which have in turn led to budget cuts that have proven to be very unpopular. And what Kansas also has is a surprisingly strong tradition of a moderate wing of the Republican Party that views itself as very separate from the conservative wing of the Republican Party. And uh, the conservative wing in Kansas has been a Senate for quite some time, but the moderates are still reasserting themselves. And uh, it's not just moderate voters, but there's a number of politicians, particularly ex-politicians, who identify that way. And in fact, a group of 100 Republican politicians went and endorsed Paul Davis, the Democrat who's running against Sam Brownback. And there are not too many states that I can think of where I've ever seen anything like that. And so I think that Brownback's unpopularity really has to do with how he's handled the budget. And I think Robert's unpopularity has to do with how he's been perceived to have gone Washington. But I think that both of them are probably dragging each other down just in different ways. Yeah, I think another interesting thing about the Kansas situation is that even though Kansas is very Republican and always sends Republicans to the Senate, presidential candidates never campaign there because it's no question that, that they're going to vote for, for Republican presidential nominees. It seems like a uh, the way Kansas is a red state is more like a fire engine red state than a burgundy red state. <laughs> because, you know, you have Bob Dole's legacy. You have Republicans who are, you know, working across the aisle, people who, who want to run for office, but they have to say they're Republicans to win. So you do have a number of moderate Republicans in the state house. You know, Gene Shodorf, the secretary of state nominee for Democrats, used to be a Republican. And I think another thing that's interesting with this, too, is that I guess back in 2000, the 2012 primary cycle, Governor Brownback endorsed the primary challengers of a number of moderate Republicans in the Senate who didn't back his tax cuts. And that seems to have engendered a, a little bit of bad blood for him. Uh, I talked to him yesterday after a meeting. He was in D.C. doing some fundraising and stuff. And he was like, that's overrated. That's not something that's not hurting me that much. I would do it again. And, you know, I got to respect him for sticking to his guns, I guess. But I think I think it's probably not overstated that moderate Republicans were not impressed when he endorsed their primary challengers who then went on to beat them. So it's interesting. Is there, is there a blue state that would be like the blue version of Kansas? In what sense? Yeah, in the sense that it always votes for Democrats for president, always sends two democratic senators to the U S but you have, you know, a more moderate state party and Republicans might be able to make inroads, maybe like Michigan where Republicans have, the state legislature and a lot of the statewide offices? Uh, you know, M Michigan is an interesting comparison, but I think maybe the best mirror image might be Massachusetts, which is, of course, a famously liberal state, sent Ted Kennedy to the Senate for decades, and uh, except for Scott Brown's brief tenure, has really always been very blue at the federal level, but for a very long time had... Uh, a long string of Republican governors until that was broken in 2006 by Deval Patrick. The amazing thing is the last Democratic governor before Deval Patrick was none, none other than Mike Dukakis. So that gives you a sense of how long that run had been. Wow. And this year, uh, it seems like all of a sudden Democrats have a shockingly close race on their hands in what should kind of be a gimme state. They've nominated Martha Coakley, who, of course, was the candidate who lost to Scott Brown, and she has her personal flaws. But it seems that maybe there's some fatigue with Deval Patrick's tenure, not that he's particularly unpopular, but he's been in office eight years. And uh, 
you know, Coakley has her problems and Charlie Baker, the Republican, is more of a blank slate. And uh, a number of polls have shown the race very, very close. Because Massachusetts is so blue, I think that that lean will probably wind up saving Coakley in the end. She doesn't have the same kind of negatives that a brownback does. But uh, that race is way more interesting than Democrats would like. Yeah, no kidding. And I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, talking about Democrats' female governor's problem, uh, I think people who follow this kind of thing are probably aware that there's only five female governors in the U.S. serving right now. And of those five, four are Republican, which the, the, the RNC talks about all the time. Um, I don't, I don't think Ryan's previous can give a speech without mentioning Susana Martinez and Nikki Haley. I literally don't think he has ever given a speech without mentioning them. And understandably, uh, they're big stars at the convention every year, of course. Do you, as somebody who's obviously more plugged into progressive world than I am, do you get a sense of why there aren't more female democratic governors and if that's something that's fixable? I think that is a very interesting question and one that lacks easy answers. I think that I would have to take a step back and say that the reason why there aren't more Democratic female governors is very much related to why the fact that there aren't more female governors, period. Uh, There are still only five out of 50. And so uh, certainly the Republican Party has done very well to elect folks like uh, Martinez and Haley. But the real question is, why aren't there 25 female governors nationwide? And I still think that there are just uh, a long series of obstacles that, you know, fortunately are changing, but still have not changed enough or fast enough that make it harder for women to advance in politics. You know, the women are still a minority in the Senate and the House as well. And so I think we will certainly see that keep changing. Democrats are running some interesting candidates, uh, women candidates for governor this year, in particular, Mary Burke in Wisconsin, who is giving Scott Walker a pretty good challenge. Uh, But I don't see it as, uh, I don't see a partisan explanation for this difference. I really think the sample size is so small that it could just as easily be four one way and one the other way. Mm -hmm. And then Rince Priebus would not want to talk about it at all. I think that's fair. Uh, so the competitive women running for governor as Democrat right now are Martha Coakley, who you mentioned, Gina Raimondo in Rhode Island, where there's not a lot of polling, but I think the most recent from Rasmussen says she's up by just five, which you would expect her to be up by more in Rhode Island, I would think, but there's not a ton of information there. And then we've also got uh, Mary Burke in Wisconsin. Besides that, Wendy Davis in Texas, but there's really no credible reason to think that she'd pull off a win in that race. Um, Any other Democratic women running for governor right now who are competitive? Am I missing anyone? You know, I can't think of anyone off the top of my head, but I'll probably, uh, you know, be angry at myself. I'll go look online afterwards. How how could I forget so-and-so? So So what interests me, too, looking back at this primary cycle, is that Democratic voters in two fairly comparatively progressive states, Pennsylvania and Maryland, chose not to nominate women. Uh, Heather Mazur in Maryland would have been the first openly gay governor, I think, in the U.S., um, you know, with Tammy Baldwin being the first out senator. And then Alison Schwartz in Pennsylvania was backed wall-to-wall by Emily's List, was you know, very progressive, used to be an abortion clinic director, member of Congress, defended Obamacare on the trail. And I think she got less than 20% in the primary, maybe. And obviously part of that's because she was enormously outspent by a self-funding competitor. But still, it's like, geez. I mean, both of them, I think, I don't think either of them cracked 30. I feel like, I feel like Mazur might have gotten mid-20s. It just seems like, it's like not only are these women not winning, but their races aren't, aren't even that competitive in the primaries. You know, again, obviously, we have sample size issues, but sure. I found that kind of striking. So I think that Schwartz ran a terrible campaign. Yeah. <laughs> and while she certainly had a very liberal record in terms of reproductive rights, she had definitely hewed more toward the centrist Wall Street type coalition in Congress. And I think that's not very exciting to progressives. 
uh, who vote in a typical Democratic primary. And Tom Wolf just ran a really good campaign. He presented himself as very likable. And as you said, he, he flooded the airwaves. He just had more money than anyone else. And Schwartz never really found the right message to strike back. As for Mazir, I sort of view her as the opposite. You're right that, that her vote total was not that great, but I kind of see her as beating the spread, so to speak, because she was running against two much better known and much better funded candidates in Anthony Brown and Doug Gansler. And she came very close to second place. And she, you know, she probably wouldn't like to hear me say this, but I think she had to know she was not running to win. She was running to sort of make a name for herself and to acquit herself well. And I think she did. And I think that that will set her up for some sort of future run. So I think it's not the last we've seen of, of Mazir, for sure. But it is the last we've seen of Schwartz. I see her as having no future. Really? Huh. That's good to know. That's very interesting. Uh, moving on briefly to the next action item. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but are there a couple third party candidates that you think could have the most impact? One and two, do you think we're getting to the point where third party candidates are no longer just a problem for Republicans, especially libertarian candidates? Are they sort of equal opportunity vote filterers? It's a great question because it really depends on things on a race by race basis. So one example where there seems to be no question that a third party candidate is hurting a Democrat is in the main governor's race, where you have Congressman Mike Michaud, who is trying to unseat Republican Governor Paul LePage, and also running is, is an independent Elliot Cutler, who came in second, actually, in 2010, but polls have showing and pulling in the low teens. The problem is Cutler is a liberal. There's pretty much no question about that. And he is pulling voters away from Michaud in a two-man race between Michaud and LePage. Michaud would clean up and LePage would have no hope. But in a three-way race, he LePage definitely has a chance. On the other hand, you have situations, for example, like the Senate race in North Carolina, where you have a libertarian who is pulling an unusually high share of the vote, around seven, eight, nine percent. Odds are by election day that number is going to go down. But odds are also that he's probably hurting the Republican Tom Tillis more than Democrat Kay Hagan, though even that's not entirely clear. Sometimes, you know, we think of libertarians as being, you know, conservative alternatives, but sometimes just having any alternative is what matters to voters, that they are just disgusted with both major party candidates and whether the voter themselves is liberal or conservative, they just want to pull the lever for the other guy. And so I, I think, yeah, sort of like you said, it's an equal opportunity problem or opportunity. It seems like a, it's, it's amazing to me that in Maine, Paul LePage, I don't think he's ever gotten above like 38% of the vote in his entire career of running and being pulled statewide. So his strategy depends on there being a third guy. He probably is the governor with the, who's won with the lowest percent of statewide voters. And it's interesting how he's also far and away the most conservative governor, I mean, north of South Carolina. <laughs> you know, arguably the most conservative governor who runs a state that touches an ocean. Um, <laughs> maybe one of the most conservative in America. And it's interesting how that's the kind of thing that really only happens if you have one of these third party guys there. Another thing that I think is interesting talking about third party candidates is Florida, where Rick Scott and Charlie Crist both have virtually 100 percent name IDs because they've been involved in state politics for so long. But we don't see them cracking 45 percent, really. And Adrian Wiley, who's a libertarian candidate, seems to be a problem maybe for Charlie Crist more because he sort of siphons off some of the anti-incumbent vote. The whole throw the bums out mantra can... You know, those people who might vote for whoever's not in charge, I think, can sometimes vote for libertarians instead. Is that something that you've noticed? Do you think that's right or off base? I think it could very well be right. The, to me, perhaps one of the greatest questions left of this election is what the hell is going to happen with those undecided voters and those Adrian Wiley voters in Florida. And I have looked at the numbers every which way and squinted hard, and I can't figure it out. They're going to have to do something, and you're right, it may be hurting Chris more, but I'm not willing to put my neck on the line on this one. I really can't say. Fair enough. I think it's also interesting. I talked to Wiley a couple months ago for a story, 
And it's interesting how much he's just capitalizing on sort of the leftover Ron Paul infrastructure. Mm. All his volunteers are people who volunteered for Ron Paul 2012, the presidential campaign, and, you know, figured out how to hand out leaflets and how to door knock and got excited about grassroots stuff. So I think uh, Adrian Wiley types could be Ron Paul's legacy in Florida, which is certainly an interesting one. So for sure. On that note, thanks so much for your time. Uh, It's been a pleasure. And I hope uh, hope the rest of your afternoon goes well. Likewise, it's been a pleasure. (laughs) Thanks, David. Bye-bye.